My name is Jay Smith. I am a physiatrist or a physiatrist or a rehab doctor or whatever else you want to call me. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm trained in physical medicine and rehabilitation and I practice at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where I'm also board certified in sports medicine. I have somewhat of an interesting perspective on ultrasound. I, I do musculoskeletal ultrasound and I've done it for about eight years. I practice in the sports medicine center where I scan independently. That is, I'm a one-man show. I have an assistant there, but I, I do ultrasound every day on our sports and musculoskeletal patients. Uh, I also have a joint appointment in the Department of Radiology at Mayo where I scan in the Department of Radiology one day a week with a traditional me and two sonographer model. So I have, as a clinician and a sonologist in different models, I have some interesting perspectives and perhaps unique perspectives. Carmine asked me to, um, to uh, moderate this panel. We have four esteemed colleagues with us today to uh, provide some discussion points regarding clinical translation of the ultrasound first uh, model. And uh, in keeping with the format that we have had uh, thus far today, we'll have each of the discussants, the panelists, uh, introduce uh, him or herself, and then they will provide some discussion points about their perspective on the clinical translation of ultrasound first. We'll let all four panelists um, provide their discussion, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So I think what we will do is uh, we will have um, uh, uh, Dr. Hopman go first, and after him, um, Dr. Scarborough and then uh, Dr. Gilbert, and then Martha Nolan. So with that, I will um, hand it over to Dr. Hopman if he's ready. Yes. Yes, okay, great. Thank you very much. It's certainly a, uh, a pleasure for me to be here. Um, uh, as mentioned, um, Richard Hopman, I'm the Dean of the University of South Carolina School of Medicine. And what I wanted to do is give you a little overview in terms of what we're doing in terms of uh, education. Um, I think a lot of it comes back to education. Uh, seven years ago, when I was the Associate Dean of Medical Education at the university, uh, we introduced integrated ultrasound curriculum across all four years of medical student education. And the decision was made at that time because it was coming very clear that ultrasound had potential for significant enhancement of medical education and for clinical practice. And we quickly discovered that ultrasound was a wonderful teaching tool, uh, especially with courses like anatomy and physiology. Also, it supplemented the physical exam, can be used to actually enhance physical exam skills of the students. The clinical applications are also rapidly expanding to the benefit of almost every specialist and subspecialist, from family medicine to emergency medicine to pediatrics, ophthalmology, sports medicine, uh, et cetera. Uh, so you can make a very strong case uh, that ultrasound, ultrasonography, the knowledge and the skill as a core clinical competency. We have found over the last six years through frequent surveys of the students, and we do those uh, at the end of every semester, uh, that the students enjoy, they thoroughly enjoy ultrasound. Uh, over 90% of the students report that it has enhanced their medical education. Through ongoing assessments of their knowledge and skills of ultrasound, we know that the students learn it very, very well. We also assess the students on their interaction uh, with the standardized patients or with patients. What we don't want to happen is for this to be another piece of technology that gets between the patient uh, and the healthcare provider. So they're graded on that as well. We also encourage the students to use at the bedside ultrasound as a motivational and a teaching tool as well. Quick example of that is we're working in the Columbia Free Clinic uh, and we've introduced ultrasound looking at patients with chronic hypertension, looking for left ventricular hypertrophy. And we're looking at their hypertensive regimen, but what we're most interested in uh, is if that patient has, in about oh, two-thirds of the patients have uh, chronic hypertension in the free clinic, as you can imagine, those patients in which we find left ventricular hypertrophy, that image is then reviewed with the patient. Um, Will that change compliance? Uh, when you talk to the patient about it looks like your high blood pressure is already changing, this muscle in your heart is thicker than it should be, uh, they're more likely to take their medications to follow up, to exercise, to watch their diet, et cetera. And the preliminary data shows, yes, it does. 
We also did a follow-up with our PGY-1s. In 2010 was the first year of graduation where the students had it across all four years. We started in 2006, and we send them a survey in their spring of their internship as part of our LCME, Liaison Committee of Medical Education. So we added some ultrasound questions. And uh, the questions were, was the program of value to you? Was it a good program? And it scored 4.5 out of 5. 88% said it was very beneficial during their internship. And these are across all specialties. They use it for diagnosis. They use it for management. They also use it for guided procedures. And 92% said that ultrasound should be a standard of medical education. In addition, our medical school emphasizes primary care uh, and with the knowledge and skill of uh, ultrasound to improve the health of the citizens of South Carolina and primary care is certainly very consistent with our message. Even if some of the students don't use ultrasound uh, after they finish residency and start practicing, having that knowledge will better position them uh, to really use ultrasound more appropriately, order more appropriately, and hopefully think ultrasound first in many clinical scenarios as you've heard about this morning. We subsequently went on to, through uh, Duke Endowment, to introduce ultrasound into primary care rural South Carolina, mostly family physicians, some general internists as well. And I think what's important there is frontline uh, decision makers that are managing patients. If we want to have the impact that ultrasound can have, it's really educating those folks. If you look at the numbers in the U.S., there are about 765,000 active physicians and 261,000 of those are either general pediatricians, general internists, or family practitioners. Uh, so a huge number in terms of primary care. So we've done a lot of emphasis on primary care. We've also felt very, very strongly that uh, as ultrasound plays a greater role in education and practice, there's really the responsibility of academic medicine to make sure it's done right. Uh, thus, we started the Society of Ultrasound and Medical Education, or SUSME, whose members really represent many specialties, radiology, cardiology, emergency medicine, OBGYN, et cetera, because we want that expertise and that experience really across the board. What we're trying to do is develop uh, best practices in teaching uh, and set standards that we all can accept as quality. SUSME meets as part of the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges every year. We've been doing that for five years now because we want that academic link. And we also hosted the first World Congress on Ultrasound and Education in April of 2011, which was very, very successful. We had over 400 attendees, 26 nations, 45 medical schools, and multiple societies and organizations related to ultrasound, education, and healthcare. Out of that, Congress came a strong partnership between SUSME and the AIUM, and that certainly made sense because we were looking to set high standards of which the AIUM is known across multiple specialties for many, many years. Partnership between the SUSME and AIUM has grown over the past year and a half, including multiple activities such as student interest groups, shared interest groups, and the 2013 Year of Ultrasound Campaign. There will be a second World Congress in September of 2013. So in conclusion, uh, I'm delighted to be here today and greatly appreciate the invitation from the AIUM leadership. I truly believe that ultrasound is going to fundamentally change how we teach and practice medicine for the benefit of millions of patients and learners uh, here and across the world. And it really is exciting to be part of that transformation. Uh, by adequately training the next generation of healthcare providers in ultrasonography, we hope to translate the ultrasound first concept into the practice of many, many health providers. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate being invited as well. I'm uh, Dr. Norm Scarborough. I'm a radiologist. I'm also serving currently as a Vice President, Senior Medical Director for Med Solutions. Uh, we provide uh, quality and utilization management services for various payers in both the commercial and the uh, government spaces. Uh, it should be noted that all of our programs and processes are, are, have been developed to ensure that every patient receives the most appropriate imaging procedure 
to meet their diagnostic needs. To that end, we have incorporated well-known and widely accepted uh, criteria and standards from not only the American College of Radiology, but also many of the other specialty societies. Uh, in fact, our evidence-based guidelines do recommend the use of ultrasound as the initial imaging procedure in many clinical circumstances, especially those that involve women and children. Uh, for, in the course of our review process, uh, we will routinely give alternate recommendations uh, when a CT or an MRI has been requested and an ultrasound is, is felt to be a much more appropriate study. Uh, I can give you some historical data. Uh, over the years, we found that approximately 6% of all CT requests uh, in patients that have rotator quadrant pain, we've recommended an ultrasound instead. And similarly, with uh, women that present with pelvic pain or other issues involving the genital organs and a CT scan has been requested, we generally have, have recommended performing an ultrasound about 7.5% of the time. Uh, similarly, in MRI, when a request is made for abdominal pain, especially in the right upper quadrant, about 4% of the time we'll recommend an ultrasound instead. And in, again, in women with pelvic pain or issues involving the genital organs, uh, we generally will recommend an ultrasound about 7.5% of the time. So this, I think this data tends to, ver uh, to uh, correlate with a lot of the comments that were made by the earlier speakers. Uh, I can speak both personally and as a company, we're very interested in continuing to uh, assist you working with you individually as well as in, with organizations such as the AIUM to raise the awareness of ultrasound and, and make folks understand that it is a very viable diagnostic uh, imaging tool with a few of the risks that are associated with using other, other procedures such as CT and MRI. That, that's been very well delineated today. Once again, I really appreciate you asking me to come here and I, I uh, invite uh, any further discussion. Thank you. So I'm Martha Nolan, and I'm Vice President of Public Policy for the Society for Women's Health Research, um, which is a national uh, nonprofit organization in Washington, D.C., uh, seeking to improve women's health through research, advocacy, and education. So for over the last two decades, the Society has been a driving force behind biomedical research being conducted on women and raising awareness of the fact that there are many biological and physiological differences between us. And until the 1990s, this may surprise me, the scientists believed that women were biologically the same as men except for our reproductive capabilities. So with the advent of the mandate that the society sought on the NIH in 1993 to include women and minorities in phase three clinical trials and the lifting of a similar prohibition by the FDA, uh, great scientific discoveries have been made regarding um, our differences. So what triggered all this, and it gets to the part of this conference, is you know, asking questions was a basic question by a group of scientists and advocates for the results of the physician health study in 1988, which basically said anyone with a risk of heart disease should take an aspirin. Was this true for women, since the study was not done entirely on men? The answer is no. Aspirin does not work for women. Women did not get this answer for nearly another 20 years in 2005. Now, it does work for stroke, but we're talking about heart disease. It is now known that heart disease is the number one killer of women and that women and men can differ in their presenting symptoms of heart attack, which can confuse diagnosis and treatment. Women suffer greater autoimmune diseases than men. We have greater bone loss than men. We are less likely to be offered total knee replacements as men, even though we have greater cartilage loss and osteoarthritis. We respond differently to the flu vaccine only needing half a dose to achieve the same antibody response as men, which causes stronger symptom reaction. And we are less likely than men, we are more likely, excuse me, than men to seek treatment for pain, but we are less likely to get it. My point in all of this is that until recently, not only did women not know to ask, but they didn't know that there were important differences about their health and that the possibility that they may not be getting the right diagnosis or treatment. I think it is fair to say that all of us assume we are getting the best possible care and that our doctors do know what they're doing or know everything, though lately we've started Googling things. Patients do want confidence that they're getting the right diagnosis, the right care, and the right time, and in this case, the right scan or the right ultrasound. Unfortunately, too often, women are misdiagnosed or go undiagnosed or are not provided the same level of treatment than that would be received by a man. 
Um, but we continue to, to try and inform and empower women to do, through research and education to try and transform the, the research, tra transform the care that they receive. Excuse me. So one way that we've endeavored to try and do this is actually through trying to get women included into clinical trials. We actually um, ran a campaign called Some Things Only a Woman Can Do. Starting in the 1990s, we had printed materials, call-in numbers, websites, PSAs. We did this in Spanish, and we did this particularly targeted to older women as well, a separate campaign, different messaging. After all, if you're not steady, we will not learn what we need to know. We also do an awful lot of public education campaigns, um, often in media briefings here in New York, obviously, PSAs, focus groups, surveys, advertisements, you name it, we reach out to the women's magazines trying to endeavor to find any, loca any way in which we can inform our women patients uh, about the care that they need, the latest research, what do they need to know. Um, I, we clearly use all the forms of social media, and a lot of this I'm saying is in essence to get the message out, what do you want them to know. We use Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, blogs, and any other form of social media we can think of, um, including um, Kiosks. I think those are incredibly helpful. I do find women do use them when you're either um, at the supermarket, you're, in, you're sitting in a clinic, you're sitting in a doctor's office, um, you're in a beauty salon. Something that triggers you touching. We're all being trained to do that and that's been very helpful. And I say all this because we've, uh, this is actually a very funny campaign, a result of, um, we did one on Know Your Numbers that had to do with asking women about their cholesterol numbers. And ironically, what the result was the women had a greater tendency to know what their weight was in high school than to know what their cholesterol numbers were, and less likely to talk about it with their doctors. So we encouraged that, and we also had pads for them to discuss it. Um, so do we think we're making a difference? I'd say yes. We feel that women are far more informed today and far more empowered about their health care. There's obviously a great deal more that needs to be done. I don't believe that there's a barrier with patient engagement and imaging options. I think most patients have no clue that they should even be asking. I'm talking about most patients, not some patients that might actually do know this. I think if it is communicated to women in the different mediums that I've mentioned and many more that will be coming about the important questions they should ask and then we empower them with those questions, easily accessible, paper, electronic or whatever, that it is more likely that they will have a meaningful dialogue with their doctors. I think that many patients are intimidated by the vast medical knowledge that all of you have. Um, but I do think that, I'm, that many of you would admit that they're having far greater conversations with their patients with the advent of the internet and other convenient electronic tools. So with that in mind, I thought about what I would talk about if I were trying to get a message out to patients, to women, what would they ask their doctor? And that, I think many of us always ask, what is our options, whether it be, you know, what are my options for treatment? But in this case, what are my options? What are the risks and exposures of ultrasound, what a patient might ask if you train them to think about it? Is it safe? That was brought up in the last presentation. What are the risks for x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, and PET scans? The average patient really doesn't probably know how to, what they stand for. There are allergic reactions to consider. There are adverse reactions. Women sometimes have more of those. They would probably want to know that. They want to weigh that in balancing their decisions. Sometimes there are concerns over if you're using the other imaging tools, not liking to be strapped down, claustrophobia, would ultrasound then be a tool that they would be more interested in? Will it be more beneficial for my disease prevention, diagnosis, or treatment compared to other radiological imaging? Will it compromise the quality of the imaging results? Under what circumstances would ultrasound be unhelpful or unfit for me? I mean, let's be honest with the patient about what is the options. Um, I think the two last points I really want to make is the cost and convenience factors are going to be huge going, are always huge and they're huge going forward. Is it covered by my health insurance? What is covered? How do I, what is it really going to impact me? And how convenient is it? Where, when, how quickly can it be done? And again, does that not compromise my, um, the results in the treatment procedures that we discuss going forward? It is still to this day the doctors who are a primary source of information for the patient, for the women. So there, this is where the conversation will really occur. And so I think that part of the conversation the doctor needs to have back is not using a lot of medical jargon um, and to write down information for the patient and to keep repeating it and to provide resources. I think that um, patients have little knowledge or they, they certainly gain an awful lot as they go forward, but many of us honestly know that once you get a diagnosis, you don't start, you stop thinking. So if you're in, the, in an office and someone basically tells you of cancer, I don't care how much, how much 
education you have, your brain stops thinking. So the question then becomes how you lead the conversation with the patient, and I think it can be easily trained, and I, we will endeavor to do our part as part of a women's health research organization, but, it's, but it, um, the dialogue is possible. Anyway, I would like to thank the AIUM for um, letting me speak today, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Bruce Gilbert. I'm professor of urology at the Hofstra North Shore LAJ School of Medicine. I, too, just like my distinguished colleagues, would like to thank the AIUM for allowing me to be part of this panel today. I, I wear several hats. One, as a representative here of the American Neurologic Association, we've had several committees that have been very intent on promoting ultrasound. Uh, one, the NUUF, or the National Urologic Ultrasound Faculty, of which I was the immediate past chair, is, an is part is a committee which is trying to educate urologists, educate urologists, and as our dean was talking about, also in education, the medical students, fellows, and residents in addition, uh, to how, uro how ultrasound can be used best in urology. Another committee, uh, that I'm part of is the UDTIC. They have these great names for all these committees. That's the Urologic Diagnos Diagnostic Imaging and Therapeutic Committee, which deals with all types of imaging, you know, certainly ultrasound being part of that. Through these committees and through our interest and through the uh, cooperation and uh, dialogue with the AIUM, we have uh, developed together, and AIUM has a, now an accreditation for urology practices. So that gets into my second hat. As a physician director of a uh, larger urologic academic practice, I am uh, the first practice, actually, that was accredited through the AIUM. And uh, it was a very interesting process, and possibly, you know, as part of the panel, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I think through these uh, techniques of accreditation, through the process of accreditation, I think we're going to make ultrasound better, better for the payers, better for the physicians, and most importantly, I think better for our patients altogether. As my third hat, I'm also a, in a private urology practice, so I split my time between an academic and a private practice. And in the private pra practice arena as a urologist, I deal with only one thi two things, uh, male reproductive medicine and male sexual health, male sexual medicine. And in these areas, ultrasound is key to not only diagnosis, uh, but oftentimes treatment of our patients. So uh, ultrasound I'm finding first is not only first in, uh, in that it's the least expensive and doesn't require ionizing radiation, but also is key to the treatment of our patients. But what my main love is, is education. And I think when we're asking questions about patients, when we're asking patient, uh, questions about payers, when we're asking uh, questions about what physicians should, you know, refer to, what imaging technique, I think it all goes back to the fact that we have to, as um, stakeholders, we have to see what is based upon evidence. And, uh, you know, as we get into the new terms with our new payment policies, of uh, comparative research uh, effectiveness, we need to know what are going to be the best imaging techniques to give the best diagnosis and offer the best treatment for our patients. So I hope, you know, as the dialogue goes along today, we can maybe touch on some of these topics and uh, talk about this more fully. Again, thank you very much for allowing me to be part. All right, thank you very much for those uh, excellent uh, discussion points, presentations. So we're gonna, we can open it up to the crowd now. Um, I think there's a microphone floating around somewhere, Glynis, or? So um, I think we'll have someone in the aisle with a microphone for, to field questions for any of our panelists. It's a great perspective. There's a question here. 
Do we have a mic up here too for the we all. They, 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 we they all, Oh, they're all wired up. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. <laughs> they're all wired. Um, my name's uh, Jack Ledun, trained in general surgery, surgical critical care. Lately, I'm the Director of Vascular Access at the Greater Baltimore Medical Center, the recent past president of the Association of Vascular Access. I'm going to ramble here. You might think that I was an invited speaker by the time I finish. I don't even know if there's a question to this. But look, fortunately for the audience, I'm not a, I'm a terrible speaker. So anyway, Dr. Hopman, what you've done in South Carolina is truly astounding. OK, to the audience, do people know how long it takes for something to go from an idea to the initial reports to randomized control trials to standard practice? Yes. 17 years. Yes. Oh, thank you. So in 1952, Obanyak described the first central vascular access procedure. In 1984, the first ultrasound procedure got um, described by Legler. So at that point, there were two ways to do this, the blind way and the ultrasound way. But it wasn't clear which way was better. In 1996, as Dr. Moore said, um, we had the um, meta-analysis of the eight randomized controlled trials that showed clearly in 1996, we had the evidence. In 2012, Troianos published his review, and now there's 30 articles. There are, you know, the evidence is compelling. Take? The evidence is compelling for ultrasound guidance. Um, so if we're going to go ahead and somebody's going to lose their leg because some idiot didn't use ultrasound and the plaintiff loses the case, I mean, where's the evidence-based medicine? Where's the, the you? I didn't, even in this audience, I didn't hear enough. Like you, when that person lost their leg because some physician or, or whoever didn't use ultrasound for the femoral for the femoral venous approach, I mean, this is ridiculous. Isn't this the era of evidence-based medicine? I mean, what do we have to do to, to get this thing to become a standard of care? I mean, this is this is ridiculous. Any comments from the panelists on that? No. So I mean, clearly, it says to me that. It answers the question that ultrasound is not the standard of care. If people can lose their legs and win the case, ultrasound is clearly not the standard of care. So certainly from our perspective in trying to change the view on women's health research is it really has to happen in medical schools and, and in publications. So, and I hate to say that really what you're learning there is, the, is really what you retain and, and there's a lot less after that. I think it's also a matter of, can you hear me? It's also a matter of um, we're going to have to live through it's lasting much longer than any of us wanted to. I think we're going to have to live through a very painful transition. Uh, you know, part of, the, of my job is to help train that next generation. Uh, but I mentioned we have over 700,000 active physicians out there now. Um, I think we need to do everything we possibly can to educate them, bring them up to speed. But I think it's also going to be a matter of um, bodies like Joint Commission, et cetera. Uh, and to put some pressure uh, on uh, institutions uh, that have, uh, you know, lines and, and could use guided procedures. So I've got a question here, and then I'm going over there. Okay, then. <coughs> yeah. uh, my name is John Santa. I'm a general internist. I work for Consumer Reports. I'm happy to be here, uh, learning a lot. Um, to my surgical colleague, I think uh, our point of view is uh, um, <clears throat> things get impl can impl get implemented quite quickly um, if uh, they make money, if they can be advertised, mm -hmm. if they can be promoted. Um, I mean, how quickly has CT uh, uh, become uh, the standard of care? How quickly is robotic surgery um, overwhelming uh, the profession? Um, so. We're interested in doing something about that. It seems like there's folks in this room that are interested in doing something about that. To their credit, many professional societies, some of them represented here, have stepped up in the Choosing Wisely campaign to do something about that, um, to respond to, I think, uh, the sorts of things that Martha um, has uh, done a good job of articulating. The bottom line is, you know, folks in this room just have to help consumers a lot more than they're helping them now and have to help them economically. Economics are driving this. Um, and uh, there's going to need to be some courageous folks um, in this room in choosing wisely and, and elsewhere if, if uh, we're going to avoid this mess. Thanks for doing this. Thank I, you, John. Ju just as a comment and response, I completely agree. I think we're going from models of reimbursement. And as we know, primary drivers are money all the time. 
Uh, if we go from fee to service to whatever, whatever new thing is going to be coming down the line, it's going to be a, a process over time to accountable care organizations, single payers. What it means and what it's going to mean is that we're going to have to take what was said by my distinguished colleagues of education of the physicians or the patients and research and documentation to provide the impetus that ultrasound may be best in certain situations. But if we have only a limited amount of funds, I think that's going to be the primary driver on what's going to happen. It's no longer going to be get it out in marketing and you know patients will clamor for it because patients can't won't be able to get it unless they pay out of their pockets, obviously, you know, for that. So I think the drivers are going to be whatever the model of payment is and that training of physicians that are already in practice, possibly, and coming up through the ranks, as the dean was talking about before, um, and research to show, to document the efficacy of these treatments. Question. Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm Frederick Golney, uh, Chairman and Residency Program Director of Urology in Brookdale. I'm also here through the American Urologic Association and the National Urology Ultrasound Faculty. I'm the vice chairman of that group for the resident education. And I'm directing my question to uh, Dr. Hopman. Um, we've had a strong push in uh, the, the uh, NUUF for uh, resident education and through the Residency Review Committee and American Board of Urology. Um, I surveyed all the uh, uh, program directors across the country as to instituting urology and residency training. And the biggest uh, problem that came back out of that survey was economics, providing the machines for the residents to do the training. And then the second problem was having the faculty available to those residents for training. So um, those two hurdles seem to be fairly large hurdles to the uh, um, uh, residency training programs. So my question to you is I'm interested in finding out how you funded through your medical school the uh, training of all these medical students. How did you provide them with the ultrasound equipment to do that training? And uh, it, would be, it would be of interest. Sure. Um, excellent questions. Um, I think there are a number of ways to approach it. Um, one is that um, we formed a partnership with GE, um, educational partnership. Um, I think uh, the market now is huge. There are lots of manufacturers out there that are interested uh, in developing partnerships as well. I think the, the cost has dropped down. I think that you're going to find that um, uh, there are leasing options, there are ways to um, uh, get refab machines, those sorts of things. Bottom line is, though, uh, it didn't hurt that I was the associate dean when we started. <laughs> um, uh, I think you have to have a commitment. You have to have a commitment from the highest level. Uh, I actually have a, a talk that I do in terms of how do you convince your deans and uh, associate deans that this is an important thing to do. And there's really a whole list of things there as, as possibilities. I'd, have, I'd be happy to, to send that to you. I'll see if I can summarize it just very, very quickly. I think in terms of advantages to medical school and residency as well um, is you want the best of the best. You want the best students. You want the best residents. Uh, and we have used that to our advantage. Um, every Wednesday when we have interview day, um, we tour the students of the Ultrasound Institute and we have our students demonstrate to them. So in terms of students making decisions, if you're competing for the best residents, this is something you can tout as uh, something you have this cutting edge. It's the way people are going to be practicing down the road. It's also a wonderful um, academic niche for faculty also, because I don't think there's any question ultrasound is going to play a major role over the next 5, 10, 15 years. There are lots of questions to be answered, research, et cetera. We've also been very, very fortunate with grants. We've gotten over a million dollars of foundation grants. Foundations get this, and i tell you the way we do that. Um, is that, for example, uh, the Duke Endowment uh, funded us to put ultrasound on 12 primary care practices in South Carolina. Uh, so we put a proposal in and we come
come before the board. And we come before the board, uh, we talk about the importance of this and where it's going. We do our PowerPoint and they say, yeah, that's nice. Um, and then we go ahead and do a demonstration and we usually do a really pretty shot of the carotid with the blood flowing on. He said, that's nice. But we always take a phantom model with us uh, and we show ultrasound guided central line placement. And the next question from the board members is invariably, when is my doctor getting one of these? Um, so I, I think in terms of uh, funding, uh, huge opportunities there. And I think you're gonna find, even from the governmental agencies, there's gonna be funding opportunities there. We've also been very, very fortunate with donors. It's the same story, they get it, as visual, they understand it. Uh, so we've been able to get um, uh, endowed professorships, uh, renovate space, et cetera, based on that. So from the financial standpoint, I think you have a number of avenues to do that. Um, what some medical schools are considering, we haven't done it yet, but we might, um, and that's to go ahead and put a technical fee on. Uh, now, you'd probably have to have some sort of relationship with, with the hospital to be able to do that. So I, I, th I think that in, in terms of um, convincing the folks at the highest levels, you want to get the best residents. Um, you get, can look for donors, grants, educational relationships, et cetera. I think all those are going to be important. I have found the most effective thing, and others have as well. Uh, I have yet to sit down with the clinician and go over it and demonstrate that they don't get it. Uh, so sometimes they're so far removed. It's probably the biggest problem that we're having in terms of deans around the country. The deans that get it have started putting it in the medical education. And we're trying to reach those folks. It just makes so much sense. And as more and more data comes in, so you have to keep moving along. I'm happy as well if there's anybody you'd like me to contact uh, and tell them about what's, what's going on. But I, th I think you can list those points of getting the best, donors, reputation, all those things would, would help a lot. One, one follow-up question on that. Um, we're under a lot of pressure you know, and conflict of interest in making align, you know, as alignments with certain industry. What, have you found that a problem with GE, your association with GE? No, actually the relationship's been very, very good and it's um, instrument support only. Um, there's really uh, no money um, and we keep it uh, through the university, keep it very clean um, and so it, it has not been a problem. There's another point in your question I just thought of as well that's an issue and that's the faculty that train these folks as they come through. You can do as much stuff as you want to do uh, in the first year and second year. Uh, we have ultrasound OSCEs in five of us clerkships so I've got a champion in surgery and OB and medicine pediatrics etc to be able to do that again it's a matter of a niche but from the Dean's office I partially support those so I buy out some of their time to give them time to do the teaching as well we also two years ago uh, since our focus is really um, uh, primary care we created a primary care ultrasound fellowship uh, emergency medicine had a great model They've gone from the early 2000s, just a handful of fellowships, now to over 80 fellowships. Those fellows go out and start fellowships. Those fellows go out and start fellowships. So we started a primary care fellowship. But I think it's going to require some support to buy out some of that time. And it goes back to the question in terms of, and I absolutely agree, in terms of reimbursement. Because um, uh, obviously it takes money to do this and it takes money to drive this to a certain degree. Dan O'Keefe, Executive Vice President of the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine. I share my colleague's frustration over how long it takes to get what is known to work out there. This has fascinated me for years, looking at this knowing-doing gap. And we know what's right to do, but we just don't do it. And how do you overcome this gap? I mean, we talk about what we're talking about here. I mean, everybody gets it. The question is, is how do we move it? How do we change human behavior? And how do we implement that? I mean, we talk about giving a lecture to somebody, and a month later they remember 5% of what we said, and nobody's changed anything, because it takes, it takes somebody six times to hear the same thing for two-thirds of the people just to change what they're thinking of, and it takes 21 days of them to do it straight to change their habit. Now, how many of us are doing this? We're not. They're, forget it. So we don't have the skills to influence people in their behavior, and that's why it's so slow. There are tools out there that we can learn, that we can go out and have been proven to markedly increase the success in all these projects that we do. And it behooves us, I think, if we're going to make anything we're doing successful and do it quickly, 
to learn those tools on how to change behavior and influence people. Don't pay them the old way. Right, exactly right. <laughs> okay, one here, then Oh, first. Sorry, Barrel. I think that uh, one of the problems in moving forward is a reimbursement for what's done. And as, I, as we'll talk about later, um, the 3D ultrasound that I showed you is not being reimbursed uh, at this point by insurers. And if a patient is infertile and needs um, an imaging modality to look and see whether there is a septate uterus, they reimburse only the MRI. They don't reimburse ultrasound or 3D ultrasound. Jim Perez, I'm a, um, a program director and uh, osteopathic program in Columbus, Ohio, part of Ohio Health. I'm also representing the ACUG, and I'd just ex like to share our experience with this whole process. About 10 years ago, maybe a little longer than that, we had a really bad experience, and out of that experience, we understood that most OB-GYNs can't read ultrasound, um, and they can't do ultrasound, and most of them hire sonographers and couldn't tell you whether the exams are good or bad. On top of that, most radiologists are the same way. They couldn't tell you which way they're at the mercy of their sonographers. So that really is a key to the educational process. We were lucky. We went to our DME and said, look, we, got a, we have a problem we need to solve here. He bought off on it, and we hired a really exceptional sonographer trained at OSU in Jefferson and came on board and started to train our residents to a different level. What was a one-month rotation now became a four-year curriculum to the mm -hmm. point where they, when they graduate, they, sit, they can sit for the, and have sat for the sonography boards and been successful in doing that. You have a second-year resident who can Doppler studies on a patient and give you accurate information. That's impressive. That's fellowship stuff. They, uh, we had a foundation that, that supported the process and gave us uh, ultrasound machines. We have a 3D40 machine, E8 in our clinic, and every day our residents are educated, and their scans that they do are at nighttime are reviewed, and they're remediated every day, and they make mistakes despite that. We did a pop quiz. We are lucky. We have a consortium of our residency programs. They all come together in Columbus uh, once a month for a day of education. So one day, we've done this on a couple of occasions, we pulled a pop quiz. <clears throat> we were lucky we had GE support us. They brought in sonographers and a bunch of machines and had patients come through and had, had all the residents in the state uh, do an exam, basic exam on an OB patient. And we gave them a quiz and we found out that most residents learn from senior residents who pass on bad, ha bad habits. And if they're not educated, they were measuring humeruses instead of fetus, uh, femurs. They couldn't <laughs> tell what position the baby was in. And the only saving grace is that most babies are normal, so you don't get a lot of bad outcomes. This process that we have uh, in our, at our hospital is exceptionally uh, successful. Our residents are, are, um, are quite good at what they're doing. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'll be back. Hi, right, thanks folks. Uh, I'm the uh, dreaded uh, pre-auth guy. I'm a radiologist. Uh, um, and uh, Chief Medical Officer of National Imaging, and we do uh, essentially what, uh, what Med Solutions and my colleague here from uh, AIM do. I have an answer that may be kind of mundane, but I, I think it will be helpful. I look around here, and this is a classic example, and I love this thing, and thank you, and please invite me again. I'm going to spend some time this afternoon with you as well. <clears throat> you have this meeting again, invite medical directors of health plans. So in my role as the chief medical officer, I do two things that should be important to you. One of them is I sit on many policy and procedure committees um, of health plans, Blue Shield of California, Florida Blue, big, big health plans. <clears throat> and I see how the sausage gets made. I mean, how they make their decisions on what to cover and what not to cover and what to push and what not to push. So I think that would help. The other thing is, um, I'm currently going through all of our algorithms and rewriting some of them. And one of the reasons that I really enjoy coming here is to listen to some of the things you had to say. Now, from, a, from our pr particularly uh, practical standpoint, the kind of information uh, comparing ultrasound to MR, ultrasound to CT is incredibly valuable. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do, and we'll, hopefully we'll get together. 
I'm going to rewrite our plantar fasciitis algorithm that will say that you must do ultrasound rather than scam because, you know, with, with MRs, because they all own these little MR units and they do that kind of stuff. So let's see what happens next year. But, <clears throat> but I know that people get frustrated with bringing things to market. Do try to understand from a, a medical director standpoint of a health plan, there are a million things these guys get hit with. I'll, an example, and Martha, I tell you, as a female, if I had to get, a, get my breast examined, I would have no idea. I mean, every it, because much of the literature that, that really gets, gets attention uh, are throwaways. So you say that uh, breast homosynthesis may be better or the gammography may be better. My estimation, guys, you do one, th you do mammogram. If that's not normal, do an ultrasound. That not normal, do a fine needle biopsy. All the rest of it is is just is nonsense. I mean, you're just going around in circles. So anyway, that's just a practical thing. Um, give us comparative data so that we can put it in because when you, we're going to get a lot of podiatrists call, calling me next year, and I'm gonna, I want to I don't want to look behind me and say, where the hell are you guys? You got to help me out. I'm going to go well, straight to Lev, Lev, Lev first, yeah, about that. to Lev first, and then uh, I'll, I'll go back to Viver. Well, I appreciate your comments, and I just want to give you a true real-life story here, is that, um, yes, there's no question that ultrasound is, is the test of choice for plantar fasciitis, no question about it. The problem that we're finding with the payers, though, is as soon as they see a, a, an uptick in any code, and it is something that has not uh, fit previous patterns, they tend to cut off payment for that code, whether it's worthwhile or not. So, so giving the example of the foot, so um, there was a large increase in use of podiatrists by ultrasound, of ultrasound in their clinics. And so in f uh, about, it was about three years ago now, in, f in four states, Illinois, uh, New Mexico, uh, 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 Oklahoma and Texas, they stopped payment for all musculoskeletal ultrasound of all types, okay, based on the fact that they, they saw this uptick and they in, in assumed it must be, well, they were paying out more money than they perceived they needed to, and they assumed it must be not clinically indicated because why is there all of a sudden this spike? So they tend to stop all the payments. So paradoxically, you have, a, you have this less expensive test, which is going to save you money per, per widget. But if it's used too much, then they cut off the whole supply. Right, but you can't disagree because it happened. I think traditionally, maybe I'll in interject a comment here. We've made guidelines as medical societies alone, and I think maybe one of the product of this forum is maybe looking into the future, guidelines have to maybe include medical directors or represent representatives of, of, uh, of insurance payers and maybe patient representatives into the guidelines. The guidelines have to be maybe a little bit more comprehensive than what we have done in the past. So we address those issues prospectively rather than address them you know, retrospectively. I think that may be very helpful as we look forward into how we put guidelines or comparative data out so we can at least uh, 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 adjust or at least uh, avoid having these issues uh, ahead of time. If I, I, if I could make one, one comment to, yes. to augment Dr. Dr. Dean, is that we, we have no interest in denying things just to deny them. That, that's not it at all. We are very, very interested in working with societies like as yourselves, as well as the individual, the individual folks that are here or, or, or groups of, of, of physicians, community physicians. One of the issues that, that, that may be a problem with ultrasound that I've seen 
is that there is a, a very wide spectrum of expertise out there, not only, in, not only in the folks that are doing the scans, but also in the units that are being used. So it's extremely important that when you do an ultrasound, for example, a musculoskeletal ultrasound, or a, a, a GYN ultrasound, great, a great modality, but it, it is so user dependent and technology dependent. So uh, it's, I think that we can easily sell this to the uh, health plan medical directors as a, as a better technology or the appropriate technology. What we can't sell to them is if, if someone does an ultrasound and then that ultrasound begets an MRI every time. You know, and and I, I've seen that in my own practice. I mean, there was rarely a week that went, that went by uh, in, my, in one of my imaging centers that I didn't have some poor lady out in my waiting room crying because someone told her she had ovarian cancer and had an ovarian tumor. And almost invariably, we'd, we'd bring her back quickly, you know, do, do the ultrasound, and, and usually the tech and I'd be in there staring at the screen going, what are they looking at? And of course, they'd always come with images. And so you, you take, and I'm dating myself now, you take the films out. <laughs> and, out. and of course, there were calipers on something, and, and once you measured, it's real. It's a mass. And so I'd be staring at it and going, well, maybe that's it. We find our ovaries, they, look, they would be pristine, just fine, maybe a few follicles or something, but nothing. And then all of a sudden, we'd find this thing, so well, maybe that's it. This is what this guy was measuring. And then about then, I'd see a peristaltic wave go through the tumor. And so we'd give her a fleet cinema, and we'd cure her, her, her tumor. Um, it happened all the time. So if, if, if we, we really are very supportive of this, but we have to make sure that folks are providing a really good product and, and, it's, and that, that it is diagnostic. And with that, I would really encourage accreditation of ultrasound facilities. That's not happening. It's, it's a, yeah, yeah it, it really is. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds simple. To me, it's, it's, it's astounding that, that people, I have arguments with people who don't want to be AIUM accredited. They don't want to have any accreditation, and I, I'm just a, a, a gog at that. I mean, I don't I don't know how to handle that. Are they going? Don't you really want to make sh tell everybody you're doing a good job? That's not that's at the community level. At the academic level, not a problem. You guys are doing a wonderful job. I'm impressed. You know, I'm a huge fan of ultrasound personally. I mean, my when I was a resident, uh, the chief of our ultrasound section, he he was just a madman, but he thought that everybody should have an ultrasound before they had any other imaging, at all. And he actually went to the hospital, uh, uh, hospital uh, uh, CEO and was like beating on his desk demanding this. <laughs> of course it didn't happen. But, but So I think that you guys are on the right track. We just have to make sure that we can get this permeated down to the, to the community level to where everybody is, is, is putting out good work you know, and, and that, that they trust the diagnoses that are, that, are, that are being rendered. I think when we do that, if we, we, come up with, we come up with good standards, good criteria, and good follow through with a good product, I don't think there'll be a pushback from, from the, the health plans. At least I, I hope not, I don't think so. I know I'll, I'll certainly support that. I know Dr. Dean will support that. It, it, it shouldn't be a problem. So just help us. Really Alfred, I think we have, what, maybe 10 minutes left just yeah. to give a key it, on I'm the time. I'm Vivek Tyal from the American College of Emergency Physicians. I work in Carolina, Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte. I'm here with Mike Stone from Brigham and Women's, and uh, there are a lot of emergency physicians that had a lot to do with this forum. Mike Blavis, Chris Moore, Jason Demore. So, and I, I'd like to say in credit to specialties like us, which have pushed the envelope on ultrasound. I don't, actually don't think this would have, have occurred without specialties like emergency medicine, critical care, and other specialties pushing the use of ultrasound in the hands of physicians. Uh, just a comment, since it, uh, the emergency department sees 120 million visits a year for the American public, and We've had guidelines since 2001 and helped push out the AMA guideline, um, the uh, AMA uh, House of Delegates resolution in 1999. Uh, we are on our second set of guidelines and we have 11 core applications for the use of ultrasound for the initial evaluation of patients in the emergency department. Um, and we use it for diagnosis, resuscitation, monitoring, procedural and therapeutic uses. We would say, and I hope you know, this is something that most of us can agree with, that ultrasound has its own knowledge base, and it is, while it is complementary to the physical exam, it is not an extension of the physical exam. And I'll tell you, this is where it, it hits the payers when we, and I'm about to ask you, uh, Dr. Scarbo, about this. What we're seeing in emergency medicine is we're seeing bundling. And, uh, and I'm sure the other gentleman back here, yes, and I've uh, already asked Sue Nesda, who's back there, who's uh, from an emergency physician representing another 
uh, payer. But uh, I mean, we're we're doing ultrasounds, we're documenting them, and we're um, and we're making diagnosis like hemoperitoneum, uh, per, you know, cardiac tamponade, ectopic pregnancy, uh, retinal detachment, uh, you name it. But uh, how are you treating the point of care, emergency department, ultrasound, and how can you know we're already under extreme financial stress, and I'm sure other other point of care users are as well. What it, why is this happening, and what 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 would you say about uh, you know bundling and point of, point of care ultrasound? Uh, I'll make a couple of comments very quickly. One is that I don't speak for the health for the health plans. You know, I'm speaking for a my particular radiology benefits management utilization management company. Uh, the secondly, uh, we don't uh, currently uh, provide any utilization management or cost management services for the emergency room. So, so I'd, I'd say that right up front. Uh, so, but but I know that the the health plans, not only the commercial health plans, but all the, also the government health plans. Everybody is getting hit by rising emergency department utilization cost. Uh, unfortunately, that's probably what's driving the issue you're describing. Is just 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 a, a continued increase in in, in those uh, just the pure volume of ED visits that's happening, and with that, uh, I'm, I suspect that they're just trying to find some way to manage. Uh, both the utilization of the emergency room in general, not just the, the imaging there, but also just the uh, and, and the cost associated with it. So, if there are better ways to do it, I, I'm sure that they'd be open to discussing those. Yeah, I know. I'm, you know, I know. I spoke before, and I know I'm the president-elect of AIUM, but I've said many times I don't consider myself an ultrasonologist. I consider myself a gynecologist who uses ultrasound. And it's very interesting when we teach these courses to people, and these are the people who are willing to spend money and pay and come sit on a weekend to learn, not the ones who are watching football games. Uh, so much of what they're interested in, to me, seems to be gynecologic management. And in reference to this issue about quality, or the quality of the scans or raising the bar, you know, I know we're here to talk about ultrasound, but it's not just in ultrasound. It's in every aspect of medicine. The 50th percentile of what's out there I got to tell you, I find to be somewhat scary. And so it's not just in, in ultrasound. We heard about Gina Colada's example with the quality of MRI that's being produced. And I mean, much of the delivery of healthcare suffers from the same problem. And I mean, if we can solve this in ultrasound, it's, it's a bigger issue than this. And, and I, don't, I don't know that I have an answer, but it's not just unique to us. That we're interested in raising the bar for ultrasound, but I think it's a problem across all of medical care. Back. I'm going to take a response from the back first. And then, Alfred, we probably, you know, by time we have five minutes left. I'll make it a quick five minutes. Um, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, Tom Dean again, I, uh, I, I, I am a radiologist, and as I said before, and I trust you're going you're gonna to help me with that, right? <laughs> okay. I come to this meeting for help. Um, the, um, the uh, methods of reimbursement in, in um, uh, emergency room and emergency room medicine is so mind-boggling. Um, it's different in communities, it's different in states, it's whatever the, the hospitals are able to negotiate with the insurance companies. Sometimes they're tiered payments, sometimes uh, there's one state that pays the same amount for every single emergency room visit. And you can do that. You can take a billion emergency room visits, divide it numerator over denominator, and just pay that. So. Bundling isn't necessarily a bad idea, it's just a way to pay. But if you don't like the way they're paying you, you're going to have to tell them that. Um, and they arrived at it certainly not with very much physician input. It's a negotiated uh, negotiated thing. And I would, I would also tell you, we, um, um, we manage a lot of Medicaid, as, as does my colleagues here, as do my colleagues. Um, we think we're really doing a heck of a job. A Medicaid uh, utilization of um, uh, diagnostic imaging, you yeah, know, somewhere, CT scanning, we'll say, somewhere between 40 exams per thousand per year. Um, and the emergency room delivery, which we are by law not allowed to manage, and I understand that, is eight times that. <laughs> so we go to an insurance carrier and we say, hey, listen, we want to buy our services, we can really manage this, we're only managing a small fraction. That's really a whole, I mean, you're, you, we're, we're hearing comments about medicine in general. But it's it's what people use. I mean, there are no there's no access, and they use emergency rooms, and uh, you know you, you know there there has to be a different model. I mean, you know, with tiering in an emergency room, 
you know, triaging and that sort of thing. But uh, anyway, keep keep it up, guys. <laughs>